Well, good morning and welcome to River Church's online worship. I'm glad to join you today and I'm glad that you're inviting me into your home as we study God's word together. This is week 10 of our series, The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. And we're looking at this theme, The Great Exchange. That's the story of Jesus and how he makes this great exchange. He takes from us our sin and brokenness and he gives us an exchange his righteousness, this great exchange. We're looking at it, uh, we find it on every page of the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, and uh, today I wanna start by, by asking you a question, maybe telling you a little, bit, a little bit about how I might answer the question that I'm asking you. The, the question is this, have you ever taken a calculated risk and had it pay off? Well, probably most of you have. You take some sort of risk, uh, you know, it's a little bit scary, it's a little bit intimidating, but you take that risk and then it actually pays off. You get something in exchange for that risk that you took. Uh, maybe on the other hand, uh, you are a very risk averse kind of person. I've known some people like that. Uh, you're afraid to take a risk really at every turn in your life. Uh, may, may I ask you another question? Have you ever taken a foolish risk and then had to pay the price you know you took a risk it was a foolish risk you you lost out on that deal and then you're like never again so now you are afraid of risk when i used to live in albuquerque lydia and i uh, not in an, uh, not in an irresponsible manner but we bought three homes and we sold three homes and we made a profit on each one of those purchases and then years later, I bought and sold a rental property. And in the process, I lost some money. It was painful. Took a risk, a little bit of a gamble, and I, I lost out in that deal. So three out of four ain't bad, right? Well, just so you know something about me, I love risk. I love adventure. I love taking risk. How about you? I'm gonna ask you a different question, but it's actually quite related. Would you say that you are a person who likes to advance, advance, advance all the time or retreat, retreat, retreat all the time? Like if you were in a battle, would you say, let's take the next hill too. Let's win the next battle too. We don't have enough land. Let's take the next hill. Or are you just good to like, yeah, hey, let's just call it good. Uh, what we got to we got and that's good enough. Are you more of, a, of an advanced, like full steam ahead kind of a person? Or you, do you have more of a retreat sort of mentality? Now, most of us would say, oh, I'm definitely an advanced kind of guy, Randy. And I'm definitely, I'm a, on the move. I'm, uh, let's take the next hill. I'm a, yeah, but, but I would challenge the notion that most of us actually have a, a, uh, an advanced sort of uh, mentality to our lives. Uh, let me tell you, we live in a culture that is like retreat big time. And I don't mean like you go on a retreat or you go on a vacation. We live in a culture of retreat. I mean, inviting someone to church, scary, because we don't want to get anybody's business. Uh, we, we move to neighborhoods uh, with, with gates and bars and alarm systems as soon as we can afford to live in that kind of a neighborhood because we have this retreat mentality. I remember growing up as a boy, my grandparents' house, it had, a, it had a front porch, a porch on the front of the house. The mailman would come and deliver the mail, and people could come and visit you on the front porch, and it was welcoming to the neighbors. Well, what's happened in all of our neighborhoods? Uh, now, the porch is screened in, and it's in the back because we don't invite, we, we're not, we're not, we don't have an advanced mentality, we have a retreat mentality. We don't want people in our business and we want to build walls and live in a retreat sort of environment. Uh, I'll give you another example. When I was a kid, we would swim in a community swimming pool. If you're young, you don't even know what that means. But we started, uh, here in Brownsville, here in South Texas, I would go to one of the, one of the local public pools. Uh, we would go to Oliveira Park and we'd swim in that pool. And you'd swim with friends and you'd swim with strangers. Everybody was just kind of part of the big mess, or big, big party rather. Uh, now, uh, 2021, if you took a flyover aerial view of, I don't know, Land of Lakes or the Lakeway 
uh, neighborhood or Brownsville Country Club, it would reveal like five or six swimming pools in a five or six house uh, block uh, with, with fences and, and gates. So that every, every pool is, is private, you know, he's, there's not enough chlorine in the world to get me into that guy's pool, right? So we have our own pools, we do our own thing, and we live in this retreat sort of mentality. And here's the crazy truth about the gospel, the story of the Bible. God calls us as Christians to be people of advance in a culture of retreat. Jesus said things like this, you, the church, you, my followers, you are the light of the world. And a city on a hill, and that can't be hidden. That can't be, 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 be hidden and, and, and set apart from it. You've got to be out a light in the darkness of the world. And, and that is an essential part of being a Christian. Jesus did the hard work of engaging in friendships, getting into the messiness of hanging around people that, that sometime, sometimes made him look bad. Uh, he, he, he did the hard work, the sometimes messy work of engaging with sinners, with people, with his community. And really, he caused us to do the same. In fact, it's, it's imperative. If you are a Christ follower, you are going to have a, a, a mentality of engagement, advance in a culture that, that surrounds us, a culture of retreat. So think on this. What, a, what a, an amazing and yet difficult job I have as your pastor. I'm called to promote advance in a culture that celebrates retreat. So God wants us to exchange one mindset for the other, the great exchange God wants to exchange one mindset for another in our lives today, in our church today. Keep that in mind as we look at a new story, a new book in the Bible for us. It's the, the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Let me summarize. Here's, what, here's what's go, gone on so far in this book, because we're not going to obviously have time to read, read every chapter of the, the book of Judges um, in the Old Testament. So far, the people of Israel have... Uh, They've, they've moved into the promised land. They've made their home that God had promised them. God promised the, 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 uh, the promised land. He delivered on his promise. And, and God told them, he told the Israelites, if you follow in my ways, if you walk according to my instructions, life will go well for you. It'll go well. But the Israelites, they, they kept getting themselves into these difficult situations and and they would not do things God's way, and they would, they would get this, they would, they would worship false gods, the gods of the, of the, the people who had previ previously lived in their, in their land, and, and it's all this pagan ritual that they would, they would turn to, uh, and so they would get themselves in these difficult situations, and life would get really hard and, and really oppressive, and, 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 and then they would, well, that's where we pick up, that's where we pick up. So, Judges chapter 6. Verse 2 is where I'm going to start with. It says, In the hand of Midian, that's another, another country, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of the Midian, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains, and the caves, and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east, they would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza. And they would leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep, no ox, no donkey, for they would come up with their livestock. And their tents, they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was, was brought very low 
because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Okay, so here's what's going on. The Israelites were living in hiding. They were living in caves, uh, and uh, understandably so, because the, the Midianites would come, uh, they would come into the camp uh, from the hill country, and they would rob them of all their valuables, and they, they would, all of their commodities, and they would just lay waste to the land. And so the Israelites were just scared, intimidated. They would, they would leave their, their home, and they would, they would make these, these holes in the, in the sides of the hills, and they would live in fear, picking up in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, uh, at Ophrah uh, under, a, under a tree. Under a tree which belonged to Joash, the Abia's right, while his son Gideon, that's the important person in this story, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the, in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon, and said to him, said to Gideon, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Okay, hard stop. Gideon, he is hiding out. He is working down in a hole. It's called a wine press where they would obviously press their wine. He was hiding there um, from the Midianites. The, the interesting thing, to work your wheat, you really need a little breeze, a little wind. It must have been difficult because he's down in a hole. He's not a down in a hole because this is a great place uh, to, to, to work the wheat. He needed the wind to blow the chaff away. He's working on this hole because he's, he's hiding from the Midianites. And he's processing a little bit of wheat just to make bread for his family. And the Lord shows up. And the Lord says to scared Gideon, he says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now I ask you, what did God see in Gideon that, that we don't see in Gideon? God looked down in Gideon. He saw something. Something that Gideon probably didn't even see in himself going on and Gideon said to him please my lord please my lord if the lord is with us then what why then has all this happened to us and and where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying did not the lord bring us up from egypt but now the lord has forsaken us the lord has given us into the hand of midian and the lord turned to him and said Go in this might. What? What? What might? Gideon must be there. What might? The Lord says, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but, but I will be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And Gideon said to him, If, if now I have found favor in your eyes, th then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Okay, you get the idea. You get the idea. Gideon is timid. He's living in a scared culture, a culture of retreat. The culture of hide away and hide out. And God favors this guy. God favors Gideon. He's not the kind of guy that you would want on your team. He's not the kind of guy that I would have picked first. But God saw something. You know what that means? You know what that means for us? You know what that means for, for those of you who feel like you're always being passed over, you're always being looked over, you're not the first picked for the team, maybe you're timid, maybe you feel like nobody sees any potential in me whatsoever. You know what this means? This story means that you are a prime candidate. God may see something in you that you don't even know is there. He's poised, he's, he's ready to do something that maybe you don't even expect. God sees something in you that you don't even see in yourself. 
That's the economy of the Lord. Now we're going to go on. I'm going to give you five brief like signs or faith builders in Gideon's life because he needed, he, needed, he needed some faith building. Where we just left off, he says, please, Lord, would you just show me a sign that it's you? Because I, I, I'm, I'm weak, I'm timid, I'm, I'm doubtful. And so there's, there's five brief signs here. We're going to find them as we continue to read through the passage. A lot of reading today, but it's, it's a really dramatic story. The first sign is that the Lord consumes a meal that Gideon prepared in one moment. Like fire from the rock, the Lord consumes uh, this, this meal. And it, it's a faith builder. <clears throat> 21, verse 21. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened cakes which, the, which Gideon had prepared for the angel of the Lord. And the fire sprang up from the rock, and it consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the angel of the Lord vanished from Gideon's sight. And Gideon, Gideon begins to perceive this, this is the Lord. The, the Lord has come to visit me. The Lord wants to do something through me. Okay, faith builder number two, Gideon takes a bold stance when no one is looking. Because <laughs> that's what you do when you're timid, right? That's what you do when you're afraid. Like the Lord is on Gideon's side and he knows it, but he's timid Gideon, so he's going to do it. But he's going, he's going to do what he needs to do under the cover of darkness so no one sees him. What am I talking about? Verse 25, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. In other words, cut down all of the false gods, that these, these foreign gods that the Israelites have, have turned to in their wickedness. Tear it all down and build an altar to me. Uh, and it's going to cost your dad, Gideon, it's going to cost him some money and a prize bull. Verse 27, so Gideon took um, 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said to him, as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. <laughs> All right, pretty self-explanatory. Like, sorry, Dad, I borrowed your bulls last night and I wrecked them. Um, honestly, one of them is now barbacoa. Uh, that's, that's what's going on. Faith builder number three. This is going to surprise you, but Gideon's dad stands up for him in public. You might think, um, I don't know, I keep thinking of Ferris Bueller's day off when that exotic uh, sports car gets, gets wrecked or falls out of the garage. But, but uh, he, 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 uh, Gideon, he uh, sacrificed his, his dad's uh, bull and he tore down his, his uh, wicked ritual pole and he uh he cost his dad some money but but interestingly at that moment in time his daddy stands up for him in public you see the men of the town they rose up early in the morning and they saw what had happened and they're like we need to get to the bottom of this who did this who who tore down the altar to Baal? Uh, who cut down the asherah pole and this this person's going to pay this person's going to be killed and then verse 30 the men of the town said to Joash, that's the dad, bring out your son that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asher beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, oh, you're going to contend for Baal? You're going to save him? Whoever contends for Baal shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, little g, god, let him contend for himself. Because his altar has been broken down. I just have to say that the confident words of a good dad will often carry a young man a long way. In a, in a very appropriate sense, 
my dad used to tell me when I was up against the odds, when I was taking on a new adventure, like maybe even planting a church, doing something that I, you know, may, may or may not go well, taking on a risk. My dad used to tell me, son, he said, son, I, I don't worry about you. I, I think if you set your mind to it, you're going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to accomplish what you set out. And that just meant the world to me. It, it must have meant the world to Gideon as well, because verse 34, there is a turning point. Verse 34 says simply, then the spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. And what you'll find in this story, it's a hinge pin. It's a turning point. From here on out, there's something different about Gideon. Of course there is. It's the Spirit of the Lord. Something about Gideon's timid obedience and the backing of his daddy changed everything for Gideon. He was obedient. He was timid, but he was obedient. And then he had the, the, the backing of his earthly daddy changed everything. Did it give him a false sense of confidence in himself, bravado? No. No, he's still the same timid, I bet a little awkward Gideon. But the Lord is on his side. The fourth faith builder is this. Gideon asks, get it, believe it or not, for one more sign. And guess what? He gets it. He asks for one more sign from the Lord, and he gets it. Verse 37. Behold, he says to the Lord, I am laying a fleece of wool on the, on the threshing floor. Now, if there's dew on the fleece alone and, and it is dry on all the ground the next morning, then I shall know that you will save Israel by hand, or by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. The story goes on and says that the next morning he woke up and, and, and it happened. It, the, the fleece that he laid on the, on the dry ground, the, the ground was still dry, but the fleece was, was completely saturated. It says he, he wrung it out and he had a bowl full of water. You might think that was enough, but it wasn't. He, he asked even one more time, Lord, Lord, please, I beg of you, don't, don't judge me here, but I'm, I'm a timid man. One more sign. He said, tomorrow morning, would you make the ground wet with dew? and the fleece dry. Guess what? Once again, the Lord was patient, the Lord was tolerant, and the Lord showed up. Number five, faith builder number five, Gideon is given an army, but guess what? It's an army of only 3,000 soldiers. <laughs> he started, you can read the whole story later, he started with 32,000 soldiers, and the Lord says, nope, that's too many. Brought it down to 10 thousand soldiers and the lord says nope that's too many you guys might think you won the war because of your might and your power too many ultimately he whittles it down to 300 soldiers and with those 300 fighting men under the leadership of gideon who is now empowered by the holy spirit they successfully defeat the midianites judges chapter 7 verse 2 the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give, to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. <laughs> so, so God says, now, this is too many. Uh, we're going to whittle it down. Tell anybody that's afraid, just go home. Just, just go on home. no. Don't worry about it. Just go home. And, and then 22,000 of the people returned home, leaving Gideon with 10,000. So Gideon, I'm sure Gideon's like, oh, great. I just lost two-thirds of my military might. Now I only have 10,000 people, just like the Lord, verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many. And so he goes through another process of whittling down the armies, and ultimately, verse 7, and the Lord said to Gideon, with these 300 men um, who lapped water, it was how they drank water, that's how they chose who was going to be part of the 300, 
uh, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. So the other um, 9,700 men, they were released to, and Gideon was left with 300 men. Leviticus, different book in the Old Testament, Leviticus 26, 28. In that passage, God promised Israel, five of you will successfully chase down 100 of your enemy when I'm on your side. And now we see that taking place. God told them earlier, when I'm on your side, five of you can chase down 100 of your enemy and be successful. That's what's going on in, 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 uh, in, in this case with, with uh, Gideon. His army is reduced by 99%. Part of the story that we didn't read, his weaponry. You might think it would be swords or it would be, be, be bows and arrows. or Maybe he had um, horses and, and, and whatever. But the fact is, he, his, his weaponry was reduced to this. Pitchers, like what you pour water out of, torches, and trumpets. They had trumpets, they had a torch, and they had a pitcher to cover the light or reveal the light. I got, you know, like, you better get back or I'm going to bonk you with my Tupperware. Like, like that's, the, that's the situation that the Lord put Gideon in. But the, the beautiful thing is, number one, Gideon followed, and number two, the Lord delivered on his promise. The Lord brings the success. The, the Midianites, the awful oppressors of the Israelites, they're soundly and completely defeated. And you might say, how cool for them. But I wonder if, if God might want to work in your life in a mighty way too. I mean, if you would say, you know, that, like, I'm a timid person, I live a life of retreat, just remember, it all started with Gideon in a hole just trying to make bread for his family. And the Lord shows up and says, the Lord is with you, almighty man of valor. What an odd thing to say to a fearful man whose name nobody even knows. Not yet, anyway. Maybe nobody knows your name. Maybe you would say, how odd it would be if the Lord worked in my life. Gideon was a most unlikely sort of character to deliver the nation of Israel, and it seems as though that is precisely why God chose to use Gideon. Gideon says, God, please, please don't mess with my emotions. I'm just, I'm just barely hanging on anyway. If, if you were here with me, won't you, just, won't you just show up? Won't you just let me see something? And maybe that's you right now. Maybe you'd say, I am just barely hanging on. And God, if, if, if you want to use me in some, some way here in the valley, here in South Texas, here in Brazil, would you just show up and just reveal that to me? <clears throat> Gideon says, your power, your presence, all the things that my parents and my grandparents told me about, why don't I see it? Why don't we see it? The fact is, in this story, Gideon didn't see God in a supernatural power, didn't see him move in an in a, in a ultra cool way until he left the wine press, until he got unstuck, until, until he took on an attitude of advancement in a culture of retreat. Was he fearless? No, he was still afraid. Was he still timid? Clearly. He worked under the cover of darkness, but he, the point is he, he did it. He cut down the astral poles. He, he tore down the, the altar to Baal. He did it at night because he feared his culture. He feared his, his people, but the point is he did it. He got unstuck. His daddy backed him. Let's, let's think on this now as we think of our own context. Getting unstuck. Maybe you feel like spiritually you're, you're stuck. Maybe you feel like relationally you're stuck. 
How do you get unstuck in, 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 a, in a beautifully uh, God-honoring sort of way? I mean, maybe you'd say, like, I don't think this is what God has for me. I think God has more, more than this for me, but I just, I'm scared, I'm stuck. I've got a few ideas. Number one, getting unstuck is going to require movement and action. If you just get up tomorrow morning and and do life, piddle at life the way you piddled at life today, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to get the same results. Ask the Lord, what is, what is God telling you to do in your gut? If he's calling you to something new, even, even if you're timid, even if you're afraid, if you're down in the wine press of your own life and he's calling you to something new, what is it in your gut? What is it? Ask him. It's going to take some, some movement, some, some action on your part if you're going to get unstuck. Like Gideon had to climb out of that wine press. He had to obey. He had to take that first step. He had to make that first meal for the angel. He had to take that first risk of going and tearing down the altar to Baal, even though he wondered whether or not that was really going to work out for him. And, and, and if you're going to get unstuck, it's going to, number one, it's going to take movement and action. Number two, it's going to take some fathers... Some, some husbands becoming bold. Maybe it's your entire family that's stuck. It's like, we're, we're just going nowhere, just spinning our wheels. Or maybe you're just a timid dad. You're a timid husband. You're not leading out. And it's going to require fathers, husbands, become bold. That, that's the nature of this story. But, but wives and mamas, you're not lost in this as well. It's going to take some boldness on the part of us as the leaders in our families saying, we're going to step out. We're going to take a risk. We're going to cover our children. We're going to protect our children, but we're going to take a risk here. Getting unstuck is going to require, number three, risk preceding reward. You're like, well, Pastor Andy, what am I going to get out of it? I don't know. Whatever calculated, <clears throat> God-breathed uh, sort of risk he is calling you to, it is going to precede whatever reward is coming. And I don't know what that is, but that's how risk and reward takes place. The risk always comes first, and then it is followed by the reward. You don't get the reward first. <clears throat> you, you don't get the reward without first taste, taking the risk. Gideon would still, uh, years later, have still been in that hole, barely scraping by enough bread for his family if he wouldn't have taken that initial risk. Getting unstuck is going to require, number four, living a life of advance in a culture of retreat. Living a life of advance, of making headway, gaining ground in a culture where everyone else is retiring, withdrawing, pulling back. I mean, this has been an entire year of retreat for our culture, right? And I understand that. I understand that. We've, we've been going through a, a pandemic. But, but I think God is maybe calling all of us out of the wine press of safety back to a life of advance. I'll end on this. How are we spiritually tepid and timid? Because I don't know. Maybe you're so asleep spiritually that you don't even realize it. Or maybe you're fully aware of it. But how is it if we, we as individuals, we as Christ followers, we as the church, how are we tepid and timid and falling asleep and no longer living bold lives for Jesus, no longer living lives of advance? Well, I got five questions. I mean, you want to write these down and then you can turn off the video and you can consider them by yourself or with your family. Number one, ask yourself, am I leading my spiritually, my, my, my family spiritually am i leading my family spiritually you might say huh you know i it's been a while like we, just, we kind of kind of have have dinner together every once in a while and you know like i get them to school and make sure that they're clothed and fed but am i leading my family spiritually question number two Am I living 
an isolated, friendless life? And that's a hard question to answer, but, but, but most of us, it's hard because it's just, it's convicting. I think most of us would say to some degree, yeah, I, I'm largely friendless. It's kind of my own choice. I don't let people into my life. I don't go out to lunch with people. I'm not engaged with people. I'm, I'm always retreating. You know, if someone knocks on the door, we turn off the light. If I need a cup of sugar, I'm going to go to the store, not my neighbor. And I, I live a, a largely isolated life. And I, I'm not answering the question for you. That's the question for you to answer. But I believe it's convicting for many of us. I mean, what, if we, what if we were, as Jesus said, a city on a hill? And what if we actually were a light that's not covered, but it, 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 it shines brightly in the darkness of our community? Am I living an isolated and friendless life? Question number three, am I pretending that my disengaged current life is satisfying? Might that be you? Might you be saying, ah, this is enough, you know? It's soccer practice and the hope of Retirement one day is enough for me. Yeah, giving my house paid off and, and having the weekends off is enough for me. Am I pretending that my disengaged current life, it's enough, it's satisfying. When God is calling us to so much more, so much more adventure as a church, so much more adventure as a family. Question number four. Um, are we as a church, are we, we living in community as a church? Are we living in community as a church? And I would say some of us are, and some of us aren't. It's hard to call a church a church if there is no community. Church doesn't mean we get together on Sunday mornings or we watch videos. I mean, that's part of it, but church means we live in community. We, we live in friendship. We live in relationship and I it's been a hard year for us hasn't it? it's been a hard year for churches around the globe to find community in this difficult time of isolation but but that's almost over now we're, we're moving into a new era I ask are, are, are we living in community as a church and the last question write it down you can consider it do I sense power in the presence of the Lord in my own personal life? Do I, do I sense that? Well, those are the questions. I ask you to take a moment, maybe take an hour, and prayerfully go through those questions. And just kind of do a little checkup on how you're doing as an individual, how you're doing uh, as a family. I'm, I'm taking this sort of quiz on behalf of us as a church. I invite you to consider that as well. I invite you a new day, a new, a new mindset, a mindset of advancement in a, in a culture of retreat. Oh, if we got to know our neighbors, and we got to know the shopkeepers around us. Oh, if we actually engaged people in, in communication and we actually helped people around us as a church, as Christians. Oh, that God might, might, might bless that. What, what might be the end result? What might be the fruit of us living lives of advancement in a culture of retreat? May it be. May it be. The Lord bless you. Well, friends, that's it. Uh, it's, it's been really, really honoring to me to, to be able to come into your home and, and, and study God's word with you. I know you're still, uh, some of you, self-isolating, and I respect that. I encourage you to go with your with your conscience, but we look forward to the day when you come back here and join us here in our space, uh, as many already have. Um, listen, if you are in need of anything, you send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we, your elders, will serve you in any way that we can. We'd love to pray for you if you tell us how we, how we, could, how we can, what, what your needs are. Um, if you uh, want to know more about River Church, go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and you can just scroll through the pages and all your questions or many of your questions will get answered right there. And now's a great time for you to go, to go to the website and give. Everything that we do here is funded by your good gifts. And so you can give online with the, just a, a click of a, a button or two. Uh, 
Uh, it's, it's simple and safe and intuitive, and so I encourage you to go and, 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 and give generously to the work, the ministry of River Church, uh, by, and, and do that electronically through our website. All right, well, listen, I'm praying for you. I encourage you, when you turn off the video now, to go through those questions that I, I gave you and really, really, really talk to God. And he'll speak. He'll, 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 he'll talk back. He will speak deep into your soul if you'll just listen. Love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.